to the NCS Tech Thoughts Podcast, your hub for all things tech and innovation. Get ready to discover the upcoming technologies shaping the future of businesses. Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Ong. I'm a senior partner at NCS Next, where we power our clients' transformation agenda through digital data, cloud and innovation. Today, I'm very happy to have with me Joseph Young, Managing Director at HPE. Joseph, before we begin, would you like to tell us something about yourself, perhaps one or two less known facts which we can't find on LinkedIn? Yes, definitely. As you said, I am uh, the Managing Director of Hewlett Packard Enterprise in Singapore. Outside of my day-to-day responsibilities um, in the IT industry, I'm also a little bit of a foodie. I think since I have been in Singapore for the last five years, I've probably tried out most of the top hawker center stores. You know, love the bak chow mi, the chak wai teow, and all of the different hawker foods. I'm also a bit of a budding cook. I like to smoke my own meat, cure my own bacon, and also uh, dabble in sourdough baking as well. Wow, wow, a lot to keep you busy. I like bacho mi myself. Where's your favorite store? Definitely the Michelin One Star. Uh, Taiwa is very good, but the lineup is a bit crazy. Probably my uh, go-to stall is this one in the Amoy Street the Hawker Center called Atur. Supposedly has the best looking hawker manning that stall. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joseph, for the introduction. And today we are talking about not just food, but a very interesting topic that's keeping the lights on for a lot of tech companies as well on generative AI. It's a technology which some say has the ability to surprise its creators, spark new ideas that human minds might never have conceived. So I know that every tech company has its own view, has its own philosophy about generative AI's role, its utility for not just their own business, but also more importantly for their clients as well. So Joseph, would you like to just give us your perspective on the role of generative AI in tech and perhaps for your customers as well? Yes, definitely. So I think we we baseline it to you know what really HPE's vision is. And at HPE, we are all about changing the way that people live and work. When we look at generative AI, that definitely has the possibility of really transforming the way that everybody lives and everybody works. You know, what we look at is how does HPE help our customers to deliver AI at scale? And with AI at scale, that can really help to automate, accelerate creation of generative AI models. And with that, we can unlock opportunities in image, video, text analysis, and also drive some transformative outcomes. Now, at the end of the day though, generative AI, while it feels like it is very good at creating something that didn't exist before, it is still based off of all of the data that that large language model has captured. And so how we train the large language models is very important. And so this is an area where where HP has been working to create specific large language models based on certain key aspects. Number one is traceability of the data that goes into the large language model. One of the things that we see with a lot of the, you know, American hyperscaler driven LLMs is you don't necessarily know what the text is that is going into that LLM, right? A lot of it may be machine learning from community generated text like Reddit, forums, etc., which can be a bit scary. And you also have this potential issue of what we call uh, textual insight, large language models learning from text that was generated by other large language models. Um, and that could lead to a race to the bottom when it comes to the overall intelligence of the system. That's true. That's interesting as well. You brought up about you know, your training of your own large language models. Would you care to just elaborate a little bit about HPE's underlying technology as well? What is it based on? Is it proprietary to yourself? So what, what HP believes in, in the end of the day, is openness and advanced technology. If you look at at you know the hardware that is underlying the hype of generative AI today, you really hear about one uh, chip vendor, stock price going through the roof, and there's uh, a huge constraint in terms of the supply of their chips. But really at HP, we believe that the legacy that we have in supercomputing and HPC. So today, HPE is the supplier of the first exascale supercomputer frontier in the US, an up and coming second exascale computer, Aurora running at the Argonne Supercomputing Center in the US and also a third one is coming up as well. Now, what is interesting about these three top supercomputers is that they all run with different technology. And this is all public knowledge. Frontier, the first exascale computer, is built end-to-end with AMD. Even the GPUs are from AMD. The Argon Aurora supercomputer is 100% Intel, right? Even the GPUs are from Intel. 
So with this, we actually have the skill set to put together an AI system from all of the chip vendors with all of the technology that is available there. What does this mean for our customers is that it reduces the bottleneck. Today, if you were to buy from NVIDIA, the lead time for the top end GPUs could be up to 52 weeks. Right? And customers just cannot wait that long to start their machine learning projects, right? And with HPE, we can give you the option to choose different technologies to put together a tried and tested solution for delivering your, your machine language project. On top of that, we actually have a full stack of AI software that can power your, your machine learning project um, with uh, what we call the machine learning development environment, um, which helps to scale your AI machine learning models across a hundreds of nodes and provide a lot of orchestration around that as well. Our machine learning data management or MLDM, which manages all of the data and the data lifecycle of what goes into a machine learning model. When we talked about traceability of your data and knowing what data actually goes into each version of the model, MLDM is a software that has been written to really solve that problem as well. And we provide all of this in an end-to-end -end, uh, appliance-like solution so the customers can deploy this very easily as well. You know, a lot of people hear about the output of generative AI, how helpful chat GPT is, but little is known about the infrastructure that's supporting it. So, you know, thanks for sharing about the supercomputing technologies. Perhaps you can also help us to elaborate from a business perspective, you know, how can these supercomputing technologies help you? How do we benefit from this across sectors and industries? Right. Now, at the end of the day, I think it's in the name of the solution itself, right? Large language models. Really what large language models are about is taking all of the tech that we can get access to and using that to uh, train a statistical model that can generate new tech based on prompts or inputs that a user puts into the system. Now, in order to do this, we really need to have a huge computing system um, that are all connected together with a very fast backend network and also the software to build all of this together because ultimately when we're bu building this large language model, it's about creating all of the link between all of the different pieces of text and building that whole, in a way, neural network structure inside the computer. And this takes quite a lot of computing resources to bring all of this together. So having that supercomputing architecture as a base really helps us to build these types of solutions. You know, there are other things that we need to consider as well, right? Number one is how do we manage all of this enormous amount of data that is continuously being generated to be able to harvest that to generate these large language models. Number two is when we talk about this huge amount of computing power that is being used to generate our model, how does that impact sustainability as a concern? Now, living in Singapore, sustainability is something that I think keeps our leaders awake at night. Being an island, we are definitely at the threat of rising ocean level when global warming comes into play. Additionally, if you look at some of the government policies when it comes to data centers in Singapore, uh, we're taking a very conservative approach in terms of energy usage. Uh, we don't want to expand too much of the energy use because a lot of the energy that we're using is not actually carbon neutral, right? So we are scrambling to find ways to have more green energy provided in the Singapore. At the same time, we're looking at ways to save the amount of energy that we use. And when it comes to generative AI, supercomputing, and all of these new solutions, the amount of energy that they use today is pretty, pretty tremendous, right? So HPE is also very focused on what we can do to lower, you know, build the, the supercomputers to run at higher temperatures so we don't need to use so much air conditioning, use different types of cooling technologies. And then from a AI point of view, how do we optimize our models so that we can use smaller models, thereby using less energy when we run them? Yes, uh, Joseph, you are spot on in sharing about the sustainability and environmental impact as well. In fact, that's just one of the points that I want to cover on generative AI, right? As the large language models become bigger and bigger, the amount of energy and computational resources is required to sustain it, you know, gets bigger as well, which, you know, there are concerns around the environmental impact on the energy consumptions and carbon emissions. So there is 
also the discussion around whether you know is there a need for such large language models to be effective or you know is there benefits of going towards you know smaller models but more targeted models on what you want to use it for can you share your views around you know this as well on sustainable and environmental impact as well as your views around llm and versus you know using a smaller but more targeted models yeah definitely i think you know just lowering the amount of energy that each component of hardware consumes is really not enough to solve the energy crisis that we have you know using software models that are more efficient i think it's going to be a very important aspect on how we develop ai in a sustainable way i think if we step back a little bit and look at just in general you know when we talk about sustainability we talk about the three r's right reduce reuse and recycle and ultimately what we want to do the best approach is actually to reduce right and i think the same thing comes with ai if we can use smaller models that are more targeted um, and that is actually reduced um, that is the only way that we can ultimately be sustainable and when i look at generative ai today and how it has launched there is a certain you know amount of fear that i have that we launched it with a certain level of irresponsibility to the environment Right. Let's not talk about the ethical aspect of what generative AI entails, but just the environmental impact of what we're seeing, you know, with ChatGPT is quite scary to me. So one of the things that I see, which is quite heartening in a way, is those companies which are for-profit companies, the amount that they charge for their generative AI solutions is not cheap, right? And I think that represents at the end of the day, the cost environmentally as well that it takes to deliver these solutions to the market. So while today it's very easy to play around with some of the generative AI or LLM models that are out there, I think it's also very important to understand the cost, you know, from an economic perspective as well as from an environmental perspective that is there to deliver these models to the market. Yeah, that's right, Joseph. I think from a business angle, now there's a leaning towards of trying out and testing out of large models and seeing benefits that it can be applied from a business or economic angle, from an ROI angle. I think more more and more so business leaders have to consider the sustainability angle as well you know before they deploy the right models and over time perhaps might explore models that are more fit for purpose and have a friendlier carbon footprint in the market as well yeah thanks for sharing that i'd like to just cover a little bit about related topic as well well generative ai holds tremendous potential you know, for innovation, for creativity, and for trying out a lot of new ways of working as well. There are also a number of uh, ethical considerations. You brought up some, you know, in terms of training using large language models, generated outputs, right? And that induces biasness and certain unfairness into the model. Misinformation and fake content is another common concern as well. And then, of course, from a artistic or creative inputs perspective, you know, some will consider AI generated model not original. Like there's a loss of originality in a lot of the outputs as well. Would you like to share a little bit of your view about some of the ethical considerations when using generative AI as a tool? Let's touch on your last point when it comes to creativity and, you know, how, how generative AI can impact the, the value of creatively generated goods. And I think it, that is to bring in you know some of the current affairs or current events that are happening right now in the u.s the screen actors guild and the hollywood writers are all on strike and uh, part of that is really their fear that generative ai will be used in an unethical or irresponsible way both to take away jobs right for the lower end actors and also the reduction of the quality of the creative output when it comes to the writers so definitely there is huge concern in terms of how we use generative AI. Now, at the end of the day, I think it's very important for all of us to understand what that technology is that we have today with generative AI. I don't want to simplify it too, too much, but if you talk to a lot of AI experts, they will tell you that generative AI is really just a very, very advanced autocomplete. And in the end, I think that is a very valid comparison. What we're doing is we're taking the, the statistical likelihood of what the next word is to, to carry on that sentence based off of all of the text that a large language model has consumed, right? So if you look at that type of a model or that that is actually what the technology is, it's actually not creative type technology. It just gives you a generalization based on everything that it's learned 
of something that you prompt it to deliver. So at the end of the day, while we call it generative AI, it is not really creating anything that is net new in the world. And, you know, to understand that, I think will give some insight into how best uh, we were to deploy this technology, right? It's good at filling in the gap. So we talk about tech summarization. I think a good usage is as, you know, we bring it to a Singapore context, NUHS and NSCC just announced a new large language model that they call the NUHS uh, Russell GPT. This is really a large language model for helping doctors take a lot of case reports and summarize them into a you know one page summary so that when you refer a patient from one doc to another, you can easily see, you know, the, the case history for for that patient or to generate a summary of patient discharge paper, right? So use it to summarize or use it to, you know, build something that is point form into a full essay. But I think leveraging or thinking that generative AI can create something that is really completely net new, that is not necessarily the right expectation. I think also the other area that we will need to in the longer term think about is, you know, existing authors are involved in lawsuits against open AI as an example. What is the source of the materials that are being fed into these large language models and do they have copyright? So when we generate text or generate creative works using a large language model that was trained from copyrighted material, what is the copyright that should be applied to that generated data? Now, at the end of the day, I don't think that we as a commercial entity can solve these problems, but these are definitely things that are awaiting our governments to go and regulate and put in some fair rule that can protect them. And uh, Joseph, it's interesting that you are sharing also on how AI is being used to summarize large amount of information around medical history, patient records, so that it makes the doctor's lives easier in terms of catching up on the background of a patient that has huge amount of records, right? That probably take him a long time to read. We have a similar situation with a client as well, or rather a context as well, that we are using generative AI to help call agents summarize customer contact history. And as a result, you know, we can bring call agents, new call agents up to speed from say six weeks of training that's required, you know, down to perhaps three to four weeks. But that's a tremendous amount of time savings to get a new agent up to speed and being able to respond to customers' queries in you know a higher quality fashion as well. So that brings me in fact to another consideration, right? We have seen use cases like this that are making lives of doctors, of nurses, of call agents easier as well. But yet we hear of concerns that AI is taking away jobs in the market. You know, what's your thoughts about that? You know, is AI really taking away jobs from people? I would say that I cannot say no, right? Definitely, I think we will see that AI will cause certain jobs to be obsolete. Let's have a look at the legal profession. You know, when we think about lawyers, we think of the glamorous case arguing lawyers in the courtroom, but actually the vast majority of lawyers are actually in the back end searching case history, searching legal precedent, etc. And um, a lot of those type of tasks can go away um, with the advent of uh, AI. We talk about jobs. If we look at the global population situation today. Let's look at the largest country in the world from a population perspective, which is China. I think the biggest worry there is that China's population has peaked. Um, and we see this all over the developed world where we are no longer as willing to procreate as we used to be, right? And so with the shrinking population, um, really driving productivity is going to be very important if we're going to continue to drive economic growth, continue to prosper as a people. And I think AI really does go and help increase the productivity of workers. And with that can help us to continue to grow our economy. All right. Thanks for sharing that, Joseph. And I heard a quote about AI and jobs uh, that I find is really very relevant for us. And the quote goes something like this, that AI will not take jobs away, but AI will take the jobs of people who don't use AI away. So I think it's, it's very relevant, right? I guess in our whatever roles and jobs and whatever businesses we are at, 
uh, using AI as a complement to the job as a useful tool is certainly something that uh, uh, we will see more to come as well. I'll kind of add on to that a little bit, Ray. I was uh, listening to this podcast earlier on AI and uh, there was an anecdote there talking about the, the writers who are striking the US and you know comparing them to, you know, there's this term, I don't know if you've heard of it, called Luddite, which were textile workers in the Industrial Revolution. They were protesting against the industrialization of the textile industry and throwing their wooden shoes into the the machine to block them up, right? Now, an interesting viewpoint of this is that the Luddites were not protesting because their jobs were taken away. They were protesting because the quality of the output was being greatly diminished by automation versus what they were doing from a manual perspective. And the writers are in, in the U.S. are actually protesting in a similar way. Right. They're not protesting about their jobs going away. It's the quality of the output that will diminish if we were to completely rely on AI to be doing a lot of the, the writing and the creative uh, writing that we have. Yes, definitely. And I think you have shared quite a fair bit of insights today on generative AI from the role of supercomputers to more sustainable models that can help business be able to innovate yet play their part in the pathway to sustainability. We talk about ethical considerations as well and certainly we will see AI being an impact to many things that we are going to do going ahead from a business angle to also considerations that we need to take to make sure that jobs becomes more sustainable, becomes more rewarding as well for the people. So maybe, uh, Joseph, to wrap up our tech thoughts, I asked a question to ChatGPT on the conversation we had at the beginning of our talk. And my question to ChatGPT is, what is the best bar chow me in Singapore? <laughs> <laughs> you know, ChatGPT gave me five answers and the one at the top is the Hill Street Tai Hua pork noodles. And that's the one you mentioned uh, at Crawford Lane Food Center. Water one Michelin star for its flavorful and well-balanced bowls. You know, it looks like something that we're going to head out to one of these days as well. We should, but we need to get there very early. <laughs> the line gets very long. You, you are right, you are right. You know, uh, AI can't help us with the queuing for now, that's for sure. All right, thank you very much, Joseph, for joining us on Tech Thoughts. We're certainly looking forward to working with you in more areas around generative AI and sharing a bowl of Pachobi later on as well. Thanks, Joseph, for spending time with us. Thank you for tuning in to Tech Thoughts. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on our podcast channel so you never miss out on the latest and greatest insights from industry leaders and experts. We look forward to welcoming you back for our next episode. Till then, stay inspired and keep innovating.